So, good morning to everyone and good uh, afternoon or good evening for uh, those who are joining us uh, online. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to, to this uh, international conference. Uh, the title is Decolonizing Provenance Research. Um, experiences in co-constructing knowledge and negotiating the future of a colonial collection. Um, it will be a two days uh, conference today and tomorrow. And um, I will let uh, Boris Vestiu um, continue the, the introduction of the event. Thank you, Ot. Is this microphone working? Yes. Um, so first of all, Old Polito forgot to introduce herself. So she's a scientific collaborator at MEG. She has been for a couple of years now, and she's been the main organizer of uh, this conference. So thank you very much already. Um, decolonizing provenance research experiences in co-constructing knowledge and negotiating the future of colonial collections Today and tomorrow, 17 scholars, cultural bearers, and indigenous representatives have accepted our invitation to debate the issue, some in their own name, some as representative of their people, and some as representatives of their institutions. They will be presented later, but I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart, in the name of the museum, and all those who contributed to this conference. Unfortunately, Due to COVID, uh, many of those, um, speak, well, most of those speakers uh, could not come and never uh, thought they could come. We hope to have five or six people coming from Germany and Austria, but uh, due to recent COVID developments, they had to cancel their coming. In the mid-1990s, when I was a student and started my museum career, provenance research in so-called ethnographic or non-Western art collections in museums was about the ethnographic context, uh, cultural context, as something to be objectified, to interpret the object. It was also about the pedigree that is provenance. Then, the association of an object or of a collection to a colonial figure was a warranty of quality and authenticity. The more prominent the colonial figure, the more prestige the object would have, and the association would be made openly in the exhibition texts and catalogues without questioning. Similarly, on the art market, gallerists and auction houses would capitalize on colonial provenance. From the 2000s, the situation developed quite rapidly. With the rise of criticisms, first on the legitimacy of some practices of exhibition making, then on the lack of historical contextualization of collections, still largely presented as a historical. It is only then that the denial of covilness, so forcefully criticized in 1983 by Johannes Fabian in his book Time and the Other, became a mainstream concern in exhibitions based on colonial collections. Then, provenance took a new turn in the sense that it became a way of justifying that we could know and talk about the history of our collections, ours, that is, collections in the care of European museums. In the mid-2000s, another influence in my eyes impacted provenance research. Starting in the 1990s, the fight against the illicit traffic of cultural property, and in particular the ratification by an increasing number of countries of the 1970 UNESCO Convention and the UNIDRA Convention, or bilateral agreements or national laws like the 2003 Law on the Transfer of Cultural Property in Switzerland, prompted more and more specialized provenance research. The obligation of due diligence in the acquisition of objects or collections by museums led their curators to consider more carefully issues of acquisition, ownership, possession, curatorship, import, export, etc. Again, museums seem to redevelop provenance research in reaction to a shifting context. In the late 2010s, museum audiences in general became more concerned about the provenance of the collections that they still exhibited just as more people are concerned with the provenance of their food or their clothes, it generally became an issue to know the context of acquisition of artworks, religious, sacred or secret objects, etc. 
stronger and more frequent contestation of the collections occurred, voiced by a broad array of stakeholders around museums, but also in the countries of origin. As a timely reaction, provenance research took place in many European museums. Permanent and temporary positions were created, research programs were funded, conferences on the topic started to be organized. From 2019, and the release of the source of our reports in France, a major shift occurred as if a threshold was crossed. After decades of relative political disinterest or defensive postures from local, regional or national governments in Europe, provenance research in relation with restitution claims appeared on the political agenda. Today, several European national governments, like those of Belgium, France, Germany or the Netherlands, have adopted restitution guidelines, passed laws, engaged in actual restitutions and are generally supporting and requiring from their heritage institutions even more provenance research into the collections of colonial provenance. So in this context, the question we put to our speakers, many of which come from outside the European museum context is this. Can you bring your perspective on provenance research and co-construction of knowledge by sharing experiences in which provenance research was not motivated by a process of justification, defense or apology of the European museum? Before we, we carry on, I want to mention that this conference was made possible by the general support of the Federal Office of Culture of uh, Switzerland, and also make a, a small note about the, the vocabulary. We, we have translators who will translate everything into French, and I think the other way around too. Uh, it is important to understand that uh, they will do their best, but we have to be sensitive to the fact that according to the context, certain words may be used or may not be used, like the terms indigenous, autochthonous, uh, Indian, and so on. Like in Brazil, some native um, people from the Amazon would present themselves as Indian, and Indian is a term that will certainly never be used in a context as Canada. So translations might be, um, might be surprising for some people who listen to us in uh, other places, but uh, we're doing our best. So I'm giving the phone, microphone back to Ode for the rest of the presentation. Um, so just a detail for the public who is online uh, with us. Um, like the, the whole the whole conference um, can be followed online and under the video player on the website of the Museum of Ethnography of Geneva, there is a, a Q&A module and so the online public can ask um, their questions there and after each uh, discussion with the speakers that last more or less 45 minutes, we will have a um, public discussion with those uh, questions of the public online and also the question of the public who is here in uh, Geneva with us today. Um, and in, uh, in order to introduce uh, the, the panelists that are going to be with us uh, those two days, um, I would like to, to present Khadija von Zinnenburg uh, Karol, um, who is an artist, historian, professor, and um, why is that? Um, and and you see you see like all the the speaker that we are going to have with us in this uh, first panel. And I don't, I don't know why it's like this. I think it's on the plate, that's why. So 
So at uh, the first panel that we are going to listen to, sorry for this um, mistake, um, is called Taonga, Te, Mohana and Tupaya. And it's about some reflection on the Rangi Hao Marae, an artist and a curator on the return of a Cook collection from the UK. And um, as I was saying before, Khadija, um, uh, she's a she's a yes artist professor in history, uh, and uh, she's leading some projects uh, on issues about uh, restitution and. Uh, repatriation um, and um, then also uh, we'll be joining Julie Adams uh, who works as a curator responsible from the for the Oceanian collections uh, at the British Museum um, in the UK since 2016 um, and um, and there will be also in this uh, first panel Kay Rabin and Jody Taroa um, from uh, the east coast of Aotearoa in, in New Zealand. And uh, they will be talking about uh, Taonga, who are the, um, which is the um, cultural treasures and um, which, with a very symbolic uh, meaning and we are going to listen to to them um, now. Okay. okay, so eventually we're five minutes ahead, so can you check with, with Khadija if they're ready? Yeah, we're here. Okay. We're here, but actually, um, yeah, Jody and Kay will begin. You want me to start, Kadisha? Yes, please, go ahead. <clears throat> Inga reo, inga mana, tēnā koutou katoa. The mihi katoa, nana nanga me katoa. Praise to the creator of all things. The mihi tuarua. Ki te hunga mate, ki hungi a tato, haere oki oki moi maira. We acknowledge all those who have passed. Go in peace and rest in love. The mihi tua toru ki ngā tipuna me ngā kaitiaki o ngā whenua kato e arahi nei a tato. We have ancestors and guardians from all over the world that they may walk with us and guide us. Ko te mihi whakamutunga ki a tātou te hunga ora, ko hui hui mai nei tēnei pō. Finally, greetings to all of, all of us that are gathered today. Hats and a prayer and song to ignite the spirit, spirit that surrounds us all. And love and lights. <laughs> Kia ora everybody, uh, I'm, I'm Jodi Taro, uh, our manga is Te Kuri Ao Tawa and uh, that recognises uh, Tawa and uh, Te Ra Wai Waka Rota. Our river that binds us is Maraitaha, our tribes are Ngāti Rangi Wahua and Ngāti Rangi Wahua and Ngāti Rangi Wahua. Um, we are the people, people of, of um, Tūranga, but particularly Paritū, my kōpū tūtia. Uh, we, we are the Pakaipu. Our ancestors uh, travelled uh, big waters of Timona Nuri Akiwa in the Pacific Ocean thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, so we are 
the Taina, we're the babies of all our relations in the Pacific. Ka nui te mihi, kia koutou, nā tuakana. Um, we, we are the keepers of our knowledge, uh, our histories, um, the connections to our environment, the connections to our, our tonga, our treasures. And they are gifted to us, and it is our responsibility to hand that on for the future generations. Um, so we do that in lots of ways, every day, with our language, uh, with our reo, uh, with our each other, and our guardianship of our environment. So... Um, in about 250 years ago, um, Cook and the Endeavour came into our bay in 1769. Um, that was three days of uh, execution, three days of a lot of violence, rape, kidnapping, and a lot of cultural appropriation, uh, walking, taking, botanists, plants, and uh, just the assumption that uh, they had the right to um, have force on our land and impose their own culture without any consideration. On leaving Tūranga, Nuya Kiwa, a name given in spirit by those of our ancestors who travelled on the waka, decided to rename our taonga, our place, Poverty Bay, because he had been in Tradley. But um, he left here and he actually, um, uh, about three miles out from Tūranga, Gisborne, he dropped anchor, he paused, and he paused off the coastline of his, um, the response was to go to the boat that looked like a bird with its sails and take force and retribution utu for the injustice and violence that had happened to the relations of ours in Poverty Bay, in Tūranganui Akiwa. Um, so eight waka left from the lands of Whareongonga, of Ngāti Rangiwaho. But the interesting thing is the endeavour to pire the called, and he kept calling in his reo, our ancestors understood. Hundreds of years, the, the travelling, had stopped by waka, but they could still communicate with each other. And they they forwarded the endeavour. But that engagement was a cultural engagement. It was a traditional engagement. They honoured each other with papa. They talked in as we do today respecting our atua that have guided us, the papa and the waka that connect us. And then they did what we do today. We start looking at our moko and sharing the things which are so beautiful to our cultures. And that's what Tupaya and our ancestors started doing. And the beautiful thing about Cook, Banks and everything, everyone so, else on, Cylinder and, and those on the endeavour is that they wrote these encounters. In, in our tradition, you share gifts, you koha. So, to, uh, and he, he knew how it would be to give tapa cloth, koha, gift tapa cloth to our rangatira, our chiefs that had boarded the endeavour. But what this enabled was the engagement with 
the others on on the endeavor solander especially so the interest of the garments the interests of um the time that we're carrying to actually for uh to take retribution being exchanged and traded now 230 years later came an interest to our people because of Damien Semin and many other academics who started researching those first encounters of Cook. The knowledge that was carried generationally by our ancestors, our tūpuna, was one of pain, anger against Cook and those of the endeavour for the lives that were taken in Tūranga. No talk about the Tonga, no recognition of Tupaya. None of that was of relevance. The mamai was carried, the pain was carried. So when Damien Salmon came to our people and she, no one else had, but she shared research and the exchange of Tonga treasures of Whareongonga, it started a chain of events. The chain of events that led to our relation, Steve Gibbs following the Tonga to the UK. Relationships with institutions, coming back, sharing, us deciding that we need to go to the UK. Khadija reaching out to us, Julie Adams reaching out to us, Damien reaching out to us. A small group of people passionate the Taonga, not the prestige of the institution, but the treasures and they having a meaning that was wasn't about um, exhibition, wasn't about cultural exchanges between institution about these Tonga, they have a spirit, they have a wairua, they are nice. connected to their uri, their mokopunga here in Aotearoa and that Modi, that life force, that energy can only come from these more us. Um, so when you decolonize um, a situation that we've been in, um, we don't have resource. Um, we don't have uh, a heavy weight of institutions uh, to carry uh, the academic muscle. Um, we don't have the heavy weight of um, being academics ourselves. Uh, we live within our community. We are grandmothers, we are whānau, we're family, and we care for the Tonga, the treasures that are around us. Um, but we have relationships with Khadija, with Julie, with those at um, Cambridge uh, University, yeah. Department of Archaeology, uh, understood um, that they had a responsibility to us also. And we went to the UK, to Cambridge in particular, and asked for those Tonga to come home because a lot of status was given to the 250 years when the game and, um, you know, the first encounters um, in that time, which was last year, enabled um, the reckon of the waka, the waka, the great navigators of the Pacific, the first encounter, yes, of the endeavour, but it enabled the return of our taonga, our treasures, uh, back to Tūranga, here, where they belong, 250 years earlier. 
They are the oldest treasures of our tribe, of our region. Uh, they represent so much to the people of our region, our tribes. But as I say, um, if it wasn't for people, this wouldn't have happened. And it is the beginning of the journey. Um, this journey around using, you know, um, institutions around artifacts and taonga is around decision making. Who has the power? We don't, but we carry, we carry the responsibility. We carry the wairua, we carry the spirit, we carry the DNA, the DNA of the Tonga. Um, we are the knowledge sharers, the knowledge of the artifacts, the Tonga, that sits with those mukapuna, that culture, and that is us. Are we prepared to share knowledge? We share everything. We are the um, we are the keepers of the whakapapa and the wairua, the kaitiakitanga, the guardianship, the modi, the force, the life force that sits with these taonga is our responsibility. The breath, the ha, sits us. They are in a paralysis. They're controlled, controlled, controlled in institutions. They don't get to live, breathe, feel, touch, hear the songs, the waiata, the karakia. They don't have that. They're in paralysis. And we are accepting of the situation now, but there are some amazing institutions which just take the tonga to the people, let our hands, our tears be around them, let our weavers feel and move through those fibers to understand the weaves. Thank you for listening to us. Um, tu Te Whaihanga is uh, the korawai, the cloak uh, that is um, that that is the the shroud of our taonga, our shit here in Tūranga. Uh, it's the beginning of our journey, um, and we're very thankful to Julie Adams. We're very thankful to our friend Khadija. Um, we're very thankful for the institutions and um, the friends behind them that have enabled us to where we are. Um, just to also say um, that the life force, the energy that comes from our taonga has also been the catalyst of new creations. Um, and we would like to say to Audi and her people in Geneva, um, come to us, come to our marae and see and feel um, where the, the um, descendants, the connectors of the Tonga are living and recreating and keeping that modi, that spirit alive today. Kia ora. Uh, yeah. Kapai, I hand it over to you, Katija and um, Julie. Okay. Oh. Oh. Brian, what do you, what's happening now? We were supposed to screen the. Brian, with ah yes, am I on? Aroha Nui, um, Julie, uh, particularly Jody and Kay. Thank you for this invitation, Meg. This is a very strange experience, I have to say, online because we can only see ourselves and we're out of sync speaking at a screen. So, and if I start coughing uncontrollably, it's because I'm at home with COVID. Um, but I wanted to just apart from thank my 
my dear collaborators, Jody and Kay, pick up on what they just said at the end, and you could see behind them uh, these pictures uh, of of whales uh, and some other images, but by no means the whole Marae, that if it were during the day that we could meet there, you would have seen the works of art that have come out of the return that Jody talked about. And I want to introduce a, a another visual insight into that location and into that process for you that we were engaged in since 2015 and very intensively in 2019. And I learned so much about provenance uh, from this work with uh, the Rangiwaho community about how it's from actually genealogy that's sung the way that Kay sung to us at the start and the way that it's drawn um, and carved and painted. But I think what you really heard in Jody's introduction and you're about to hear more of is that she um, was very excited actually about the archival research. So this conference has an introductory text and the text says that Indigenous people might be more focused on visual examination and clues than they are of archival documents. But that wasn't at all our experience and we're actually going to reflect on our experience today. Thank you, Boris and Ord, for the opportunity for the four of us to return to this process that we went through because what we've actually realized in preparing our presentation is that there are a lot of i think very rich reflections on the process of repatriation that we want to share um, in a conversation today after these short presentations of each of our perspectives of what happened i'm not going to speak too long i think you heard how provenance can be used to decolonize from jody just then how Providence is not in the service of, um, as Boris said in his introduction, uh, research that is uh, used to kind of usually block a return because there's a lack of, of written archival evidence, but rather that in this case, it was used very much as a creative and a healing uh, process. And so I'm going to show two short segments of a film that um, I directed and Jody and Kay and Rangiwaho and also Julie at the British Museum and many others uh, participated in. And there are two parts, and I think there are two important parts for, uh, for the discussions that will follow in the next two days. There's the labor and the logistics and the work of museum provenance uh, research. And we're all engaged in that, and that takes up a lot of our uh, time and energy. But there's another layer, and that is the significance of these returns. What happens? What is the level on which these taonga, these treasures, are actually received and internalized and responded to? And that's what you're about to see, um, led by Jody and uh, Kay. And it's a story about Te Hakui, um, Otanga Roa a whale that arrived. The moment in time is just before the Taonga arrived. This enormous whale, Te Hakui or Tangaroa, they named her, um, arrived on their shores. And that it's a, it's a kind of understanding of the return that I think is um, is what you might feel through, through these first few minutes. And then um, I'll introduce the second few minutes and that's more um, a focus in the museum on, on what we were doing and just so you can really see where we were and what spaces we were in because importantly as Julie will then after this show us the Taonga went to the Marae first before the museum and, and that was really significant and they were and still are on loan and that's another aspect that is very problematic and very interesting that we're going to discuss after mine and Julie's short presentation. So um, Brian, s'il vous plaît, uh, une première clip. There's a place where sometimes whales from all around the Pacific Ocean travel a long way to gather and sing to each other in their particular dialect. They sing and learn each other's songs. 
They carry these back home with them. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Jairi Turoa hau, nai tāmanu hiri te iwi, muriwai taku kāinga, nō tūranga nui a kiwa taku rohe, paritū mai kō pututia. I come from a village, a special place, where on the 12th of July this year, a beautiful 18-metre female fin whale beached at the foot of our maunga, the Kuriapawa, our sacred mountain. We've not had a tohora, a whale come to our place for nearly six generations. What our brothers taught us is that when a whale beaches her or himself, they do not want to drown in the mona, so they take themselves to the whenua. So we were really thankful, because it was a tangi, a tangi for someone special that had come to pass, and we cried for her. But she died from our polluted ocean, and her being at the foot of our maunga, our sacred mountain, has messages that 250 years ago, cooks, banks, Salanda came into Tūranga, and every day that they were here in Tūranga, it was a tragedy. Tūpaia, he aereo, he rangatira, he tōhunga. Tupaya comes 250 years later as part of this kaupapa, around the first coloniser, the first intrusion, the first murder, the first abusers by the coloniser. So when a tohora comes to the people before, everyone gathered and everyone knew the process, the tikanga, the karanga, the karakia, for our men before they start the mahi. And we named her Te Ha Kui O Tangaroa. All our people of the Pacific that every day have to face all the challenges of the climate change, of all the paruparu, the filth and degradation, desecration, all the laws that bear down on us, ka nui te mahi. All the people of the Pacific who reach out and revitalise traditional learnings, ka nui te mahi. All our people that take the learnings and create them into resources for all the tamariki, all our mokopuna, ka nui te mihi. And all our warriors that get into those boats, that go into those courts, that take the front line, ka nui te mihi. We've been doing it for a long time. We won't stop. Ahi ahi ki te manoa, toto ki te toto, whakapapa, we won't stop. We are humari, we are thankful, we've been given a tohu from Tangaro, Te Hākui o Tangaro, that gives us a lesson and says to us, whatever we want to hear, whatever we want to feel, and whatever we need to do, we do it. Nā reira whānau, kā nui te mahikia, koutou katoa. Yeah, we felt really privileged and honoured. And we were totally in awe. Totally. Mm. Our men that found her, one of our nephews, he sat with her for two hours. It's really touching and beautiful.
Ta hora nui, ta hora roa, ta hora tino momona. Piore piua piua, fiore piua piua, ta hora kaua nai te moana e. We weren't serious all the time. We were able to have fun and make light of it. Our cousin from Mahia told us that we should call to the whale. But because we never had done this before, I was gobsmacked. I just couldn't. I couldn't. But she did, and it was really beautiful. The soft bones of the whale are good for Cody dieback. So the Cody and the whale have the same genesis, the same whakapapa. So Cody dieback is, seems to be a modern day phenomenon. It's wiping out our Cody. It's, people are very fearful. felt that she came at a time that was significant because Tonga from 1769 artifacts from our ancestors were coming back and she was the first sign that it was significant that it was a good thing. So you see here the kinds of research and knowledge that Kay and Jody and the Rangiwaho community were generating in the process. So the kauri is a tree, just to, to give a little bit of um, a background and also to show you that there's a whole um, environmental dimension that, that Jody and Kay introduced here um, in within the research that they're doing on, on the tanga. And that is that uh, the, the whale bone and knowing how to treat that and then uh, feeding that to the trees on the shore actually cures a an illness that the that the trees are experiencing. So they reuse this um, this tragic kind of polluted uh, situation of the ocean that that leads to deaths like that of the whale, and and turn it back into something creative by feeding it to the land. And I I thought that this was a really beautiful. Um, it's not even a metaphor. It was a real situation that happened just before the return of the Cook artifacts. And that's why um, we decided in the beginning of the film to focus on this story of the whale. It goes on and, um, and then near the end, uh, and this is a rather more documentary section, there are parts of the film uh, that focus on, uh, let's say, an understanding of the ocean, which is so, uh, different or within a kind of local and indigenous ontology um, and and tries to get it at that. Um, but in this next section, you see the moment in the museum when the whole community comes around and is able to uh, welcome and also study and research the actual materials that have arrived from the UK. So, Brian, s'il vous plaît, un um, uh, clip de... We, we had no oral history about this. We did not know that Cook had traded or Whareo in 1769. Dame M. Salmon had a hui with us at the Marae and told us that this, was, this is what had happened. That before going up to Tolaga Bay, the, the Endeavour spent three hours at Whareo Ngoonga, and there was, there was an exchange of taonga. It was really well recorded by 
Parkinson, Solander, uh, who was the botanist, Banks, as well as Cook himself. I think we all together there were five different viewpoints of what happened, and so we know in quite a lot of detail about that exchange. It was over a period of three hours, and the tonga that were that were exchanged. And so now, 250 years later, they come back. So the life force that's with them, that's what we are welcoming back. That's what we are feeding. And we're going to probably have a bloody good cry. We're going to have a karakia. We're going to whakamauri. The strands the are so fine mm -hmm. that if you didn't know better, you would think it was done on a loom. So my mother was a weaver of wool and she had her own little loom, as, you know, as well as our aunties being weavers. But it was all done by hand and it was tight, you know, close weaving and perfect lines. And then knowing that some of them are from Whare Ongo, you know, from our tribal bound, tribal rohe. I mean, we don't want to get all precious about it, but, you know, it's our inheritance, it's our heritage. It's, 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 it's a heritage and inheritance for the whole of Tūranga, the whole rohe. You know, he taonga tukuiho, it's... It's treasures that have been passed down. Mai inga tipuna, mai i te whakapapa. Oh, it's so fucked up, eh? Hey, that you you think that you've won lottery because you've got a taonga from the other side of the world and it doesn't mean a check shit to you other than a bloody load of money. Mm. And it's, you know, money is nothing. Yeah, it's just, these mm. things are priceless because... They're us, you know, they're in our DNA. Mm. So they are the first examples of Ko Fai Fai, and we are all totally captured by them. Totally. T and the, the carving is fine, once again. And we don't have examples of that, of that craftsmanship. And they used primitive tools. They didn't have steel tools. And yet... The f workmanship, using adzes and you know the old stone tools is is amazing. The detail, the intricacies. I'm excited for everybody here. I think they're going to take it. They're going to take their own art into another realm and to another level. And I think they will. As artists do, they will recreate, create and recreate and then recreate again. Yeah, and I just think there's not going to be any limit to the expressions that they give it. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Julie now to talk from the British Museum. Hi there. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I can hear, I think, Jodie and Kay just a bit in the background, so I don't know if it's possible to, to just mute that out, but um, just like to uh, thank the organisers for um, inviting me to be part of this panel into Khadija and uh, Kia ora to Jodie and Kay, and thank you for that beautiful cordero, um words that 
have introduced so many of the issues um, that are so pertinent to this conference. Um, so my contribution really is to um, maybe just share a few reflections on um, the kind of museological uh, aspect of this process. Um, I'm curator here at the British Museum now, um, but previously worked at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge, which was also one of the uh, institutions that was involved in this project and, and loaned um, Taonga back to, um, to uh, the Tairawhiti Museum, where the exhibition Tu Te Whainga opened in 2019. Um, so um, that's the perspective that I'm kind of bringing to this, um, to this discussion. So initiatives um, in the field of provenance research and collections associated with Captain Cook are certainly nothing new. And since the 1970s, really curators have been um, actively working to connect particular objects with Captain Cook. Um, and that's partly because of the seminal moments that those first, those first encounters between Cook uh, Europeans and indigenous peoples of the Pacific, but it's also got a lot to do with the kind of celebrity status that Cook has acquired in Britain. And so much of the work that's taken place has, um, it's been about really trying to identify particular artifacts with Cook collections rather than necessarily connecting those collections with communities. Um, but then in 2010, as Jodie um, explained, um, work at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge started, uh, curators started working with um, Maori people from the Turanga region um, in New Zealand. And Jody already mentioned, but I should also acknowledge the work of Professor Dayman Salmond and Dr. Amiria Salmond, who were the ones who initially um, did that kind of provenance research that we're all more familiar with, the kind of um, documentary historical archive label gazing um, <clears throat> work that allowed these Tonga to be connected with the particular tribes of that region. And the, um, <clears throat> the image that you can hopefully see on your screen is of one of the paddles, the hoi, <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, that really that was the kind of catalyst for all, for all of the, um, the work that came after. And um, you can see on the, the blade end of, the, of this hoi that there's this distinctive painted patterns and also just at the top of the shaft, a carved section. And both of these um, attributes were what um, led uh, the curators and researchers um, in Cambridge to, to reach out to the tribes of that region. And th those are um, artistic styles that can be directly connected with the people of um, the Turanga region. So, so these paddles were kind of the, the, the means by which the, the journey of these Tonga um, traveling back to home to New Zealand, first time in 250 years, that was the kind of start of it all. And once news of these uh, existence of these paddles in institutions in the UK reached um, New Zealand, mu museums like Cambridge, Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, the British Museum, um, began to receive requests from um, interested parties um, uh, who wanted to connect with their Tonga and wanted to learn if there were more um, Tonga that could be um, connected back to their tribes. And so that's where the kind of traditional work of provenance research that, that is familiar with a lot of museum, to a lot of museum colleagues, became something different and it became more about kind of co-constructing to kind of engage with the, the terminology of the conference um, about co-constructing knowledge. And at that point, I felt like my role um, kind of shifted to um, facilitate in a way the, the provenance research that was starting to happen in, in New Zealand, um, the work that was happening there. Um, where people like, as Jodie so articulately um, described in her opening there, that, you know, that, that people on the ground there in New Zealand were, were trying to reconnect these Tanga and feed them back into the um, historical narratives that they have around those first encounters with Cook. And, and 
you know, that process was um, complicated, it was fraught, it was often emotional. As Jodie said, these, these encounters were, you know, there, there was violence, there was death, there were kidnappings. And so I think that um, the tongue of that had survived and are in the institutions in Europe now um, are, uh, are kind of are implicated, are, are intertwined with these very painful um, encounters. But also reconnecting these Tonga um, also allowed like new narratives to emerge and, and um, we already heard about how uh, Tupaya, the Tahitian navigator who was on board the Endeavour, um, has become a kind of figure for um, Maori to connect with and to, to you know, reinterpret those, those narratives. Um, so all of the historical reckoning, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, including the survival of the Tonga in institutions in Britain, um, has become part of this kind of um, process of historical reckoning. Um, and the work that happened after the provenance was established in the UK is kind of an indigenizing of provenance research, I would say. Um, in a way, the, the kind of museum style uh, provenance research can only take you so far. Identifying a moment of collection doesn't necessarily make artifacts more meaningful for indigenous uh, communities. It's about the catalysts often for the work that comes later. So for my own part in this whole story, um, in 2015, after I left Cambridge and went to the British Museum, um, in 2016, I then traveled to Aotearoa and to the Turanga region and met with, um, representatives of the, of the Maori tribes. I was taken to Marae sites by Jodie and Kay um, and worked with uh, Ngaita Manihiri, Te Atanga Mahaki, Ronga Whakata, Ngati Oni Oni and Te Atanga Ahoati. Um, and there I sort of shared uh, on the Marae sites is, is the location where these talks often happened, but I, I gave presentations and showed images of the objects that had been collected that are now in UK museums. And that sometimes was quite a confronting experience. Um, at that point, it didn't really matter where I was working, if I was working at um, the British Museum or, or, or in Cambridge um, or wherever, rather than being a kind of representative of a particular institution, I sometimes felt that I too had become implicated in, in, some, in these historical encounters. And I always remember at one talk, um, I think it was Steve Gibbs, but someone um, introducing me in a kind of semi-joking way as a descendant of, of Captain Cook. Um, and some people at, at those presentations asked very direct questions about issues of repatriation, issues of theft. Um, other people wanted to know how they could access these collections. Um, other people had very specific information that they wanted to, to learn about the objects. So, you know, how many warps and wefts were there in a cloak per centimetre? Uh, how many times could a tattoo belt be wrapped around a body? So that visit to, um, to, to New Zealand at that time, I think, was crucial alongside the visits that, as Jody described, that were being made coming in the other direction. It was that relationship building that was really crucial. So the plan then developed um, at the instigation of the Maori groups um, to host an exhibition in the region to coincide with the 250th anniversary of Cook's arrival. And that's when um, the desires and hopes of the Maori community came face to face with the, um, the, the, the many stakeholders, if you like, um, within museums. So um, the work kind of broadened out for far beyond the work of, of curatorial teams to involve loans committees, loans coordinators, the people that pack the town off for travel, mount making, all of these stakeholders um, needed to get involved in order to facilitate the return of these, um, these Tanga. So um, the British Museum has a, a really large loans programme, but in order to kind of, um, to make the loan of these Tanga meaningful, it, it, we almost had to kind of rethink a lot of our standard working practices. So, for example, if I can uh, move on, there we are. Um, 
it's standard practice for the museums that when um, objects return, it, when objects go on loan, they go um, straight from the airport or whatever their point of arrival is, and they're in a truck and they get taken to a secure storage site within the museum. But the the Maori um, committee that had been formed in Gisborne to to work planning the exhibition, you know, made it clear that actually no, that wasn't um, appropriate for for these um, taonga and. And so the museum staff, you know, beyond myself had to appreciate that in this instance, it wasn't objects returning, it was ancestors returning. And for Māori, it, it, it was their ancestors coming home. And the site that that um, return needed to happen on was a marae site and not in a secure museum storage site. So this image on the screen now shows uh, the truck which had driven straight from Auckland Airport to Gisborne, took about eight hours to drive and then went straight to the marae, um, Te Poho Rawiri, where they were, uh, the crates with the objects were unloaded by um, actually local Maori um, secondary school kids and uh, carried on to the marae. Um, and hours of careful negotiation um, between um, the communities there and, and museum staff um, meant that, that, where, that Maori were able to greet the, the, the crates, their ancestors coming back onto the marae and weep for them and mourn for them and welcome them as is culturally appropriate. And um, we had to arrange for permission for, special permission for the crates to be opened there in the marae, as you can see there. Um, and uh, for the taonga, um, in particular the, the hoi, the paddles, to be removed from their um, crates and to be touched, to be passed around, to be uh, caressed, to be held, to be activated by um, members of the community. And then, as you've seen in, in Khadija's film, that was followed by um, uh, two days or three days, I think, of, of workshops where um, people from the local communities, carvers, weavers, um, artists, local tribal groups were, were able to come into the museum and um, engage with the, with the objects up close and personal. And, and that was about, you know, so much more than just the, the exhibition. The exhibition was um, the kind of end product. All of this to my mind was still part of the, the ongoing, you know, the provenance research. How does a cloak sit on a body, not how does it sit on a mannequin in a case? Um, and this is a, a shot from the, the exhibition opening. So after all the, the workshops and the, 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 um, the work had gone on, the final opening of the exhibition. So I just wanted to, um, to, I suppose, to sum up, to say that, you know, when institutions around Europe are thinking about provenance research and, and you know, um, at the British Museum, we, we're using this phrase global co-curation um, to, to, to think about ways of working in the future. I think it's really important for, for museums to realise that, you know, this work, these resources will be, will require the contributions way more than, than curators. Um, and it's, it's way more than traditional provenance research. It's going to require really key shifts in, in working practices, such as, you know, people that work in the loans teams that work on um, mount making, that all of those uh, resources will be required for this project of, of um, whatever phrase you want to use, decolonizing, indigenizing, global co-curation. Um, provenance research, to state the obvious, is not and, and cannot be a destination in and of itself. Um, so thank you, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, Brian, the next slide, I think on the same PowerPoint, I hope, um, we still have a little bit of time. If I could have the PowerPoint, the second part of the PowerPoint, please, Brian. Ord had put it into one PowerPoint, I think. There should be some more slides there. Brian, Sibu, please, is there one more? Yes, okay, great. So you see here um, 
part of this project was also with the Royal Museum's Greenwich. And you see actually Jody's work in the background behind uh, the canoe in uh, where you see the blue and um, and in between that, uh, she can tell you more about it or you can visit it. This was the new Pacific galleries um, that allowed us uh, to meet several times in London. And um, we uh, designed these round tables where we could invite, well, we could use our budget basically, uh, redirect the funds um, from the usual kind of provenance research directed at um, museum professionals and rather bring in community stakeholders from around the Pacific um, both based in London, but also coming like jo Jody and Kay from uh, Aotearoa, and then really having discussions over long periods of time together. This is how the film was installed. Um, TB21 is an organization that began to support the production of that in particular. Um, and it traveled around and was translated, as you saw, for Manifesta. At present, it's in German in the ZKM. Um, and these are just some background um, texts that my research on repatriation has come from. Also, it's where Julie and I met actually in Cambridge, and I worked a lot with um, Julie Goff, too, a fantastic Australian colleague on um, digital repatriations. I've just finished a book. Um, that kind of sums up the complexity of repatriation for me, stemming out of earlier um, publications like this one on the in-betweenness of things. And um, staging within museums at present in Vienna, I'm actually speaking to you from Vienna, um, discussions about what the future of museums is, what do we do with the kind of empty spaces that are left when these repatriations occur, and seeing those as productive spaces in which um, Indigenous artists can also intervene. So that's the topic of the kind of um, the future project that came out of this work with um, Jody and Kay. Um, and these are some of the themes, I guess, that for me crystallized in the process of working on, on the project in Aotearoa. Um, and that is that we couldn't deal with decolonization if you look at the top of these themes and the politics and ethics of that without also dealing with scientific conservation, which Julia just mentioned, obviously, all ideas about security, about packing, all these things had to be completely um, renegotiated in the process. So we were not just dealing with material culture, but also, and on the left there, with a different set of laws um, in order to perhaps begin to think about objects having their own set of rights. And New Zealand has, of course, and it's not a coincidence that we were working in New Zealand. The Maori have for so long been campaigning um, for their rights at the UN for over 100 years and have even got the legal rights to personhood of, um, of rivers and, and other um, very important sites on their land. So they're really um, avant-garde on, on that level. And I think that that's why we were working together as well. Um, so that's to say a bit about methodologies and, and I think we've already, you've got a sense of how we were working with oral histories and performance and so on. Um, and I guess where we were getting to, and, and this is something Jody also mentioned about sharing knowledge and, and trying to understand um, in the kind of philosophical term of ontology, but understanding kind of these taonga in their terms and really through those days and days of handling and research on site, understanding better their connections um, to the kind of provenance on history that we already had. I don't want to talk too much. I think what we really want to do here as, uh, as a final um, moment, can you please put us all four on screen? Is that going to be possible? We would like to um, conclude by uh, having a discussion because as I said, um, so Brian, Civil Play, can we all please be on screen able to speak to each other? Um, to the to the audience is that is that something we can do yeah fantastic so we wanted to just um, discuss together maybe I don't know if Jody and Kay do you want to say anything for example about the significance of of the Taonga coming to the Marae instead of the museum because when we spoke last time you said it had been really productive those days there but once they were in the museum um, there was less 
engagement. Um, but, you know, once these things were in vitrines and on display, um, as Julie just said, it totally shifted. Just something about the significance of them coming to the Marai and the difference of those two spaces, maybe. There you go, thank you. Jody, do you want to say something about that? Do you remember? Were you half asleep? <laughs> Late at night. No, no. <laughs> I mean, or anything, anything you want to add? I mean, there were a few things that Julie and I picked up on. There was that question. There was also this question of the loan. And I mean, the things are still there because of COVID. They were only given on loan from the British Museum. That was significant and difficult. And there was always this question of who was going to pick them up, who was going to do the dirty work of actually getting them from the museum once this loan was finished. So. Um, I'm sure the people that are watching are interested because each each person engaged in repatriation is dealing with similar issues. On what basis are things given back? Are they loaned? Are they deaccessioned? You know, like Macron has now just given back things to Benin um, without the loan dimension. But there was something about the loan that um, created maybe a lasting relationship. What do you think? <laughs> Thousand, thousand images. There were so many um, issues coming at us. Uh, but, but, but around them coming to the marae and being able to touch them, what, what the pictures don't show is the, emotion. Is the emotion. You know, there, was, there were tears, overwhelming emotions that even we didn't expect and um from our children and from the elders and from our, our peers and from our fano it was um it was like having our ancestors there with us and it, it was so bloody powerful even i get tingles on the back of my neck just remembering but before i go on thank you thank you julie for such a great um recapture of the whole journey but but around the loans there were, there were several issues we were not we were advised not to mention repatriation we were advised that we could talk long-term loans we were we wanted to, of course, we wanted to keep the Taonga, but that was never a consideration. COVID hit and we were like, yeah, it's supposed to be. The universe is on our side. These Taonga need to stay here. Our people are working overtime to make that happen. The, there was a question around why can't you have 3d imaging you know we were offered 3d imaging why can't the the muse, museum have 3d images and give us back the taonga there was consideration around why can't we recreate these taonga for you and we'll have the originals there were lots and lots of uh we, us trying to connive around how can we keep these taonga because they're so precious and amazing and they need to be with us. We need them. Our children need them. Our, you know, their future is so important that they be here. They are catalysts for us. They, um, we want to run an exhibition around them. We want to, it's just, it's just ongoing. They, they, they have sparked something that I can't even put into words, but Julie, you know how powerful it was when you came and um, Kadisha, you saw it too. And, you know, I, I, I can, I feel so hopeful now, not just for us, but for Indigenous people everywhere, that 
you know, a pathway has, is opening and the Taonga are speaking for themselves and for us. Okay. And thank you, Julie, for making that happen in Kadisha. And it's type of collaboration that, you know, we, we need to work together to, for it to happen. Mm. Kapai. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Thank you very much, Kay and Jadi, for those uh, last words. Um, there is no question on the Q&A for the moment, but I will open uh, the question for the public here. I don't know. Yeah. I can't hear anything here. Um, hello, um, I do have a question, I'm sorry it's a bit general, I'm just still thinking about it, it's for Khadija, so you are an artist and also a curator and um, I also saw in the video that uh, there's a we that is being spoken like uh, I'm, I'm assuming is, I'm sorry I forgot the names, uh, one of the two uh, ladies uh, in New Zealand that they are speaking about themselves, like, like using their own language. And <clears throat> my question is, you as an artist and curator, how do you approach artistic research in a process that somehow it's uh, how to say it, it's coming more for like anthropological, like social anthropology. What I'm trying to see, like me myself, I am an artist too. And like, I often find art to be not uh, enough well equipped to address uh, cultural issues like this. And also an objects, these objects, they're like not necessarily art in the sense that actually alive and they have like meaning and uses and they are not meant to be exhibit, but like use and reproduce and touch. So what is your take as an artist or like what do you think art can, <clears throat> can add to this, um, to this complex process? That all of us could actually say something from our different perspectives about that. Um, as artists, we, research material right i mean we have a sense of the as you say the liveliness um of of something that is made the kind of relationships that we build to the things we make and i think that's quite different to um traditional curatorial practices where um as julie was saying you know wall labels are written and relationships are kind of made to texts and collections and so on. So I think that partly what we learned was uh, that there was connections that could be made through the, I mean, let's call them Taonga. We never actually spoke about artworks. That's why we use that word because that's a, a word that better uh, represents uh, these, and objects doesn't work either because as you say, they're actually subjects. Um, I have found actually that art is an absolutely not only adequate, but really open and productive format in which to explore collaboratively the significance of, um, let's say, contested, wounded, um, difficult uh, histories, because together, as we heard from Kay and Jody, there's a process of healing and that's not without its own kind of conflicts and difficulties, but all of that can be expressed in new Taonga, right? The importance is to stay in the same medium. So we're researching Taonga and out of those old Taonga, there are new Taonga that are made and that are now on the Marae. And it's that kind of uh, relationship and inspiration that's important. And that resonates with all the people that come every day to the Marae rather than, um, yeah, than the wall label in the museum, which maybe someone reads and maybe they don't. 
So um, I don't think we are, any of us identify really as, as social anthropologists or curators, but in a, in a sense, as they said, we're kind of collaborators, but maybe Jody and, and Kay want to add something to why, why the arts are important, because they also made an artwork for London. Um, Jody included the passport of her mother and it was something very personal. I don't think anyone was being conceptual about kind of art in that sense, but there was an important story being told in space. I think that that's what was at stake, at least for me. Do you want to say anything, Jody, about making, for example, the Kofi Fire? Yeah, no, kia ora. I think, um, well, I know actually um, that when we, uh, um, when we, when we're in the position uh, that we were around reclaiming um, our Tonga, our um, ancestral connection. Um, we also up against uh, a bit of, um, how would you say, some of our relations also claiming that connection. So you've got to start getting really to uh, not Tonga being about ownership, but Tonga being the connectors of traditional knowledge. So these beautiful Tonga that we have are symbolic of the traditional learnings, the whariwānanga, the institutions uh, that our ancestors were born into and that came from um, the islands, our tūpuna, you know, the, the just all the intelligence to create these amazing, amazing tonga, which Kay was saying, I mean, you, we, we've got the amazing artists today that could never recreate what has come from 250 years ago. So they represent the actual exemplars, exemplars of these amazing institutions of learning that we had at that time within our communities. You know, um, and it's indicative the way they were exchanged on the endeavour, and and um, and in in turning that around, as Khadija has mentioned, we had an opportunity uh, to create our story through the British Maritime Museum, and um, we did that in a way where. Um, you know, elements of today actually reflected and connected with um, the journeys of our ancestors. So uh, my mum's passport, and my mum has passed away, um, one, um, the only way we could travel today is if we've got a passport and now we're going to need vaccination, you know, certificates if we want to travel. But in the time of our ancestors, uh, there was no uh, passport your rite of passage was through that, you know, those institutions of learning. And that, that's what took us, our um, ancestors on that passage, you know. Um, and just, you know, we, we become cultural ambassadors like in these provenance journeys. Um, and that can get, you know, um, we've got to be really careful because it, it kind of has a, a starting point and an end point, you know, um, and, and then what? You know, again, our, our tonga shift into a paralysis space. We as the artists, the communicators, the vessels of knowledge, we, you know, go on and, and create, um, and we're inspired, but we create these new works, but, you know, our tongue are pushed back into the paralysis space. And that paralysis space are the institutions for us. And we don't get a say on where they go. And just recently, Tonga that are part of the first collection are in a exhibition in France, I think. And, you know, they're labeled Pacific Clubs. Now, how thick and ignorant and dumb is that? Pacific clubs, you know, 
and and these have come out of Cambridge and wherever else, and we don't have a say. And I, you know, I just think people have got to grow up and get a bit mature about um, where and how um, we engage culturally. You know, if, for us, provenance is culture. Our cultures not colliding. And our relations say that next door cultural collision but you know we're, we're coming together um we have to make this work so yeah um sorry mate i might have gone around in circles a bit but um julie's probably got no, something right. more to yeah, add yeah. I think you should say something about that because yeah, yeah. Um, just like I don't know how we're doing for time, but just Did quickly you? on the, the question from the, um, the, member, the member of the audience, Did I you? think Khadija covered it really is that, you Did know. I don't know if you're hearing me. Sorry. Yes, I'm hearing you. Um, we just have five minutes left uh, before the next uh, talk. And uh, we just uh, re uh, received online a question maybe that is more for you. Uh, from Julia Binter, and, sh and she's saying many thanks for the moving and uh, inspiring presentation. And she's wondering whether you, Julie, could talk a little bit more about the negotiation process between different laws and rights of objects. How did you make the British Museum agree to the paddles to be held and caressed? And she's thanking you. Um, thank you for that question, and I suppose I can answer it quite um, quickly and also maybe refer back to Jodie's very um, uh, appropriately strongly worded uh, comments there um, about the loans process generally. Um, I think I think I said in my talk that for, from, from my point of view, my education was to go to um, to the Gisborne region and to meet people on the ground. And then when I came back to the British Museum, I was, I suppose, able to um, be the conduit for those relationships to, to feed through. So I worked really closely with um, particularly the loans coordinator, who's the person within the British Museum who's responsible for the, all the procedures that have to, the boxes that have to be ticked, if you like. Um, and and I basically sat down with her and, and talked about, you know, what the, the return of the Tanga would mean to people on the ground in New Zealand. Um, we talked through what the Tanga meant, what their significance was, uh, why it was important for them to go to the Marae rather than to go straight into museum storage. And I think it's just about um, a broadening sense of what those roles um, might involve in a museum context, you know, a mount maker, um, you know, you might think that they're kind of working in isolation, looking at the, the tongue and creating a mount, but you know, they, how much better amount are they going to make if they are part of that process and they understand the significance of the, the pieces that they're working with. So a, a brief answer is that it was a, it was a process of me, um, you know, bringing the team together from within the British Museum so that we all understood why we were supporting this loan and why we wanted to make it happen and what the um, impact would be um, on the ground if if those Tanga were to go to the Marae. And I think Jodie and Kay have given a sense of that. To go back to Jodie's comments quickly, which is, is I just find so interesting. And I, um, I think this is something that, I don't know, speaking from the British Museum, my position within this institution that this is this phrase co-curating um i think can perhaps easily be misunderstood as co-displaying so in other words working with indigenous communities to create displays but what curating is in my mind is about a, a whole lot of other activities and relationships um, more than just the displaying, it's about, you know, um, who, how the Otang are stored, who gets to say what that storage is like. When they go on loan, as Jody says, you know, um, uh, I don't know of any institution um, that at the present time would uh, seek permission from 
I'm talking about in Britain, sorry, would seek permission from a, a source community to get their approval for a Pacific club to go to an exhibition in France. And these are all like crucial, crucial questions if we're talking about um, decolonizing and indigenizing museological practice that, that museums will need to engage with and, and, um, and, and you know, um, try and find a way forward. And I, um, maybe I'm ridiculously naive but I feel it like I feel excited about that and I feel like it's it's time and it's it's a, a journey that that we need to go on yeah sorry rambling a bit there thank you so much yeah so we are closing closing the first panel and uh, we will let the floor to the second one and uh, Boris will introduce the second panel and thank you very much, Khadija, Julie, Kay and Robin.